If somebody asked you what the volume was of these different shapes, could you give them an answer off the top of your head? Probably not. <laughs> Maybe for the cylinder, because that's just the base times the height. You know, the base is pi r squared, just the area of a circle, times by the height. But how about a cone, or a pyramid, or a sphere? You could go and look it up in a book, but you could also derive it for yourself. And that's what I'm going to be showing you in this video. In this video, I'm going to show you how you can use calculus to derive the volumes of these shapes yourself. I'm going to use the cone as an example, but you can apply the same procedure to the other shapes too. Okay, let's get started. So here's the procedure. We're going to approximate the volume of our cone using a whole load of disks. These are basically cylinders. And we already know how to calculate the volume of a cylinder because it's a simpler shape. It's basically the base times the height. So we're going to call the height of each one of these cylinders delta h. And we know what the base is because it's got a radius r and the base area is basically pi r squared. So if you can work out the volume of this, and then this, and this, and this, and add them all together, that's an approximation to the volume of a cone. Now, where calculus comes in is we actually shrink this delta h down to be infinitely small, which will mean that we've got infinitely many of these disks. And when you hit those infinities, that's when your approximation becomes exact. And then you can actually prove what the volume of the cone is. So a good thing to do at the beginning is just to try and get a bit of an intuition, a bit of a guess as to what this volume of this cone is going to be. We can start off with the volume of this enclosing cylinder. So I'm going to set just some constants. So say it's got a height of big H and the base has got a radius of big R. Then the volume of the enclosing cylinder is going to be volume equals pi r squared times h. So we know that the volume of this cone is going to be smaller than the volume of the cylinder because it's inside it and it's going to be smaller by some factor. And the actual volume of a cone I'm going to give you now is a third, oops, a third pi r squared h. So this is what we're aiming for. This is the expression we're going to derive. Hopefully with a slightly less weird looking three. So here are the three steps that we're going to do. First, set up a sum. Second, express the sum in terms of the height. And three, do the integration. Okay, so step one, setting up the sum. So we need an expression which is basically going to be this disk plus this disk plus this disk plus this disk. So what we can write is that the overall volume is approximately equal to, let's just start on this first disk here. So it will be pi r squared times delta h. So that's for the first one, and we're going to just write the sum. So we're going to use this sigma, which is just the denotes we're adding up a load of disks together. So to actually perform the integration later, we're going to have to represent this r, the radius, in terms of height, because the thing we're integrating over is the height. We can't integrate over the radius with respect to height. You'll see what I mean later. But basically we need to just rewrite this r and replace it with some expression containing an h, the height. So just to show you what I mean in a drawing, let's just draw out a sideways view of this cone. So here's going to be my zero point. We've got a radius r. So this r is a variable, so it goes from zero out to here. So, so basically it's related to the height, the variable that's height, because when you're at half the height, you have half the radius, right? So say this disk here, it's at half the height up the cone, and so it's got half the radius here. So there's definitely a relationship between this h and this r, which we want to try and work out. So we've got a constant which is the base of this has got radius r, so the biggest that the variable r ever gets is big r, and h goes from zero up to big h. That's the highest, and it goes, we've just arbitrarily chosen that this is gonna be our zero, zero point. But this is mathematics, we can choose to do whatever we want, but this is just how I've set it up to begin with. 
So now my challenge to you is to work out what is the relationship between this little r and this little h. As a bit of a hint, if you're 25% of the way up the height, you'll actually be 75% of the way up the radius. If you're half the way up the height, you're only 50% of the way up the radius. And if you're 75% up the height, you'll be 25% of the way along the radius. So because this is a straight line, there's a sort of inverse relationship. So my challenge to you is to find the expression that relates R to H here. You can pause the video now if you'd like to give it a go. So this can be a bit difficult. This is kind of like an abstract kind of problem solving part of this whole integration. You can't just follow a formula. This is something you have to actually like play around with yourself. So the way I thought about this is as follows. If I imagine that the radius is just, just the, a one unit and the height is one unit, it keeps it simple. So if I am 25% of the way along this radius, so say I'm here, I'm at this point here, if I've got r, little r over big R, that means that if this is sort of like 0.25 and this is 1, that means that 0.25 divided by 1 will give me 0.25. And so the height we want to be 0.75. So we can take the same ratio of heights, but we've got basically we need to start from up here and minus 25%. So we've got big H minus little h over big H. So this is actually an expression that gives us the formula for this line here. We can rearrange that in terms of r, so we can write it as r equals big H big R minus big R over big H times H. So now what we could do is replace this, this r here with this whole expression. The trouble is this gets incredibly messy because if we had this whole thing squared, we'd have to multiply out the brackets and it would be a big nightmare. You would actually end up with the right answer, but you'll end up doing a whole load of algebra. So there's actually a way of expressing this thing here in a much more natural way, which gives us a much more simple formula. And I just did this as an exercise to show the pitfalls you can fall into. So what I'm gonna do is actually flip this on its head. So now this is our zero point, this is our radius variable, this is our height variable, and now this line is basically increasing for r and h at the same rate. So we can write little r over big R is equal to little h over big H. Because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence here. When they're 25%, 25%, 50%, 50%, and 100%, 100%. So rearranging this now, we get r equals big R over big H times H. So now this is a lot more of a simpler expression to substitute into here. So let's finish off step two now, expressing this volume in terms of the height. So I'm going to go up here. So the volume is approximately equal to the sum of pi now we need to do the squared, so we're going to take this expression here and square it. So it will be r squared over h squared times little h squared times delta h. Now we can just simplify this a little bit more by taking out the constants, which are pi big R, which is just the radius of the base, and big H, which is just the height of this cone. So V is approximately equal to pi big R squared, big H squared, sum of H squared times delta H. Okay, so now we're ready to do step three, which is to do the integration. So we can turn this into an integral. So now instead of having these delta H's, this is where we shrink down these sides to be infinitesimally small. We have infinitely many of them. So right now, as I've drawn it here, there's four chunks. So I could write this sum. Sometimes you can put a number at the top of the bottom. So it goes from zero up to four. Now what we're gonna do is zero up to infinity. And this is gonna be, instead of a delta H, which has got a finite size, this is gonna be infinitely small. 
And basically what we do is we re rewrite that as an integral because that's basically what an integral is. So the way I do this is v is now equal to all this stuff at the beginning, pi r squared over h squared. And now instead of a sum, I've got an integral going from zero, so the bottom here, up to h, big H. And we still got the h squared in the middle. And then instead of delta h, we're now gonna write a dh. If you don't already know how to integrate h squared, I'm just gonna do it. It's beyond the scope of this problem to show you how to do that integration, but it's something that you pick up. Basically, you just raise the power up one and then you have to divide it by a factor corresponding to that power you're raising it to. So basically it looks like this, v equals pi r squared over h squared, and then this is when I've done the integration, use square brackets. So it'll be h cubed, so we're raising that power at one, and then we're multiplying it by a factor, which is basically um, the same as the, the power. And then we need to put in our limits, which is from zero to big H. So the final part of an integration is we have to put these numbers, these limits in here. And so it'll be big H minus the zero. So then it will be V equals pi big R squared over big H squared. And then it will be a third big H cubed minus, well, a zero in here, a zero cubed times a third, which basically just gives us zero. So now we can just get the final answer. So V is equal to, we'll take this one third out to the front. We've got the constant from pi. We've got the R squared here. And now we have to sort out the H's. So basically this H squared cancels out with an H squared here and we left up with just one H. So there we go, that's the answer. Same as what we were aiming for. And it does in fact have a slightly less weird shaped three. So that's how to use calculus to derive the volume of different shapes. You can use the same procedure for any shape. The difficult steps are actually one and two. First, setting up the sum, knowing how to split your shape into these different bits and then how to formulate this expression here. So you wanna be able to represent all of the variables in your shape in terms of the thing that you're minimizing over. So in this case, it was height. But if you're doing, say, a sphere, um, what you might do is take disks, concentric disks that get smaller as you go up. So then what you'll have instead of this triangular shape, when you look side on, what you'll have is actually this line here. So instead of a straight or a straight line here, you'll have to actually model this curved line here. So you might wanna try that on your own to see if you can apply this yourself. Another one which is very similar to this, but slightly different, which is probably a good next step would to be do a square um, based pyramid. You can also do a triangular based pyramid too, to see if you can get that. I think this is a really cool example of how you can use calculus to do something useful. And it kind of unlocked the value of calculus for me when I first learned it, because instead of just accepting equations, I could start deriving them for myself. I could see where they came from, which was incredibly satisfying. I hope it does the same for you. Okay, but that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Just want to tell you, I've got some new posters up on my DFTBA store, the Map of Chemistry and the Map of Biology, and I've got a load of other posters there too. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on another video very soon.